Welcome to Off the Shelf, your inside look at the Wayne County Public Library. I'm Miriam, your friendly neighborhood librarian, and today we have a bunch of fun segments for you. Watch as we go on location, see what's happening here at the library, and connect with the community. Hello, my name is Deborah Kitko. I am the genealogy librarian here at the Wayne County Public Library. Today we're going to take a tour of the wonderful genealogy and local history department here in downtown Worcester. So join me in this small little journey to see, to explore what type of resources we have and to take a view at what our department really looks like. Here on the right hand side is what we call the staff desk. And this right here is where you'll find myself. Once again, my name is Deborah, Elaine, or Christina. All three of us work on a regular basis in this department. So stop by the desk. If this is your first time here, we can give you a brief tour of our facility, how, how it works. Uh, if you have questions from the very simple, such as, you know, how do I get started, to the very advanced in terms of I just can't find my great-great-grandfather, we're here to help meet your needs and try to help solve your problems. As you enter through the doors of our department, straight ahead you'll find the beautiful 1856 Baker's Map. An original, this was actually original given to our department several years ago. You may find a digital copy of this available through the Library of Congress website. On either side of the Baker's map, on the taller bookshelves, you'll find our new books. These are the ones that have recently been purchased or donated to our department. In the middle, underneath the Baker's map, would be our circulating books. These include a lot of good information in terms of how to research your family, whether it's with your Italian roots, your German roots, your English roots. We have some information about DNA as well as some social media. These are available for checkout at the normal three-week time period, and if there's no holds on these books, you are able to renew the books for an additional three weeks. Okay, as you come into the department, on the right-hand side, on the farthest wall here, you'll find our technology area. This is where you'll find our reader scanners, as well as our browsing microfilm readers. With our reader scanners, you can actually um, scan images onto a flash drive from microfilm or from the internet. We do have full internet access as well in this department, and we have access to such wonderful databases as Ancestry Library Edition, Heritage Quest Online, American Ancestors. Uh, we are actually affiliated with the Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, that site has our online obituary index. Also with the Ohio Memory Project through the Ohio Historical Connection. You'll find many of our images, uh, photographs, some documents, uh, some historical newspapers available through the Ohio Memory Project. And we are also have a subscription to the uh, Kidron Mennonite um, the Swiss Anabaptist web database, which includes a lot of the Swiss and Mennonite ancestors that settled down in the Sonnenberg Kidron area. Go to our website for future tutorials about the Wayne County, Ohio Online Resource Center, as well as other resources available here at, with the Wayne County Public Library. The website is www.wcpl.info. The Creston Historical Society was incorporated in 1983. Um, a historical fact about the society is D Dave McIlvain and Gary Murray held a wake for the Erie Railroad on July 24, 1982. They had a parade from the funeral home, laid a tombstone at the rail for the railroad next to Pike Station Restaurant, which is still there today, and had a party and dance at Pike Station. Dave deposited $680 in the bank from the party in the name of the Creston Historical Society and for the use of the project. This was the impetus to actually form the organization. In January 1983, the Creston Historical Society was incorporated with President David McIlvain, Vice President Philip Madison, Secretary Kathleen Slater, and Treasurer Charles Stebbins. Their first meeting was May 17, 1983. The Creston Historical Society published historic buildings on Main Street and sold ads for the printing cost in 1983. In 1990, the Historical Society received a legacy from Donald Sonnedecker. Because of his legacy to the library and the Historical Society, the library board was able to proceed with the building of the new Creston Library. Donald's bequest to our Historical Society was distributed to contribute to the Donald Sonnedecker Historical Room, which houses the holdings of the Creston Historical Society, and to create two trust funds the Donald Sonnedecker Memorial Fund and the Creston Historical Fund at the Wayne County Public Library and to publish Creston Past, Almost Forgotten, 
The work and expenses of the Creston Historical Society continue to be funded from the interest remaining from Donald's gift to the community. I'd like to show you some of the collection here. We have scrapbooks from different family members. So if you'd like to research some of the families in town and some of their personal scrapbooks, we have holdings of those here. We also have newspaper clippings starting in the 80s all the way through current. So anyone from the Creston area that might be um, have anything mentioned in the newspaper, uh, people are bringing clippings in, and uh, Kate Slater is keeping books on those. We have books on every Memorial Day parade that's happened, um, any of the ox roasts in town, all service members that have served from this area from the Civil War to present. We have yearbooks dating back um, to 1908, obituaries. We have uh, several books of obituaries from families. We also have several copies of the Creston Journals, um, 850 weekly papers published from 1904 to 1923. They were all microfished, and um, they are held at the main library in Worcester. And we do have a few of the originals that were laminated here that you can look at. All the material here in the Creston Historical Room is able to be viewed during regular library hours. So all you have to do is stop the desk and ask if you can come in and look at materials. And you can make copies of anything that you would like, but nothing can leave the library. Next we have our What's Happening segment. We have some great staff picks, a look at our robotics program, yep, we have one of those, and an example of an upcycling program done here at the library. Welcome back to Wayne County Public Library's Staff Picks. I'm Arlene. I'm Miriam. And I'm Kimberly. And we're going to discuss some of the books that we think you'll enjoy. My pick is Day After Night by Anita Diamond. Now Anita Diamond is the um, author of The Red Tent and The Boston Girl, so you might be familiar with, with those titles. This book is based on true events. It tells the story of 270 men and women who were held at Adlit, which is a holding camp for Ill illegal immigrants in Israel um, right after World War II. It's, it's centered around four women um, who develop a very strong friendship after arriving at Atlete. Um, there's Leonie, a beauty from Paris, Teddy, a Dutch Jew, Chandel, a Polish Zionist, and Zora, an Auschwitz survivor. Um, they all come to Atlete with their own experiences of the war and, and um, the Holocaust and all that. And um, it just, they developed this really strong friendship. And um, along with an amazing supporting cast in the book, these women learn how to live again. I really love this book because it tells of a time period that I knew nothing about. And I just, I love books that I can learn something from. Even if they are fiction, you can learn things from them. So, um, so I would definitely recommend um, Day After Night by Anita Diamond. Who was your favorite character in that book? Um, I would say it was probably, um, I don't know, I, they all were just amazing. I couldn't pick a favorite one. They all added, you know, so much to the story and their experiences, and they all came from just totally different experiences that I would have a hard time picking one. They're all very, all four of them were very strong women characters. It was, I love strong women characters. All right. Was that your favorite book by that author? Or? Um, yeah, I have to say so far. I've read The Boston Girl. I want to read The Red Tent. I haven't read The Red Tent yet. So, um, I don't know. That might change. But right now, this is my favorite book by this author. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. My turn. Uh, my book is The Historian by Elizabeth Kosova. Um, this book uh, follows three different timelines. So, it's the narrator, who remains nameless throughout the whole book in the 1970s, her father in the 1950s, and then her father's mentor, Professor Rossi, in the 1930s. And what happens is, when the narrator finds this dragon cutout book, she asks her father about it, who tells her, for mysterious reasons, for whatever reason, when he was a grad student, he found the book. And when he told his professor about it, his professor told him that when he was a grad student, he had also found the book. So, when her father's father suddenly disappears to go find her supposedly dead mother, the narrator goes on this amazing journey to find this, uh, the tomb, uh, the long lost tomb of Vlad Tepish, who's a 15th century uh, prince, European prince, and his, which is 
and it's also like it's fiction so it's this um he's also like the fictional like count dracula like the count dracula and so um we have to find out like does she find where her father went does her father find her mother does anyone find the tomb of vlad tepish aka count dracula i don't know you have to read the historian also spoiler alert one of the librarians is a vampire so would you say this is your favorite um vampire book uh, I like this book, but no, my favorite vampire book would be Twilight because I love Edward Cullen. <laughs> okay, my book is Snow Like Ashes by Sarah Rauch, and this is a teen fantasy, kind of along the lines of Game of Thrones, but for teenagers. This is the first book in a trilogy, and the main character in this is name is Mira. And she is an orphan girl from a land called Winter. In this world, there are four seasons and four rhymes. And the four seasons are, of course, our seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And she is originally from Winter. Her season has been taken over by Spring. The Spring King killed the Winter Queen and stole her conduit. Her condu conduits are where magic comes from in this world, and the Spring King broke their conduit in two. And as we start this series, they are looking for the conduit, the winter people are looking for the conduit pieces, and Mira is going out to find half of the conduit. The Spring King wears half of it, and the other piece is in a Spring Kingdom. And Mira is going to find that piece to see if they can rescue the piece. And will she find it? What will happen to the winter people? Will they be rescued from the Spring King's wrath? Read Snow Like Ashes to find out. So would you say Mira is your favorite fantasy character? Um, did you really like her, or are there others that you like? Well, I really liked her. She was a really good character, but my all-time favorite fantasy character is Legolas from Lord of the Rings. Okay. All right. Bring him down, Legolas! <laughs> <laughs> I've never read that book. Thank you again for joining us. You can find these and many other amazing books at, at any of your local branches of the Wayne County Public Library. Thank you. Introducing the Eggbot, the library's new drawing robot from Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories. Yes, that really is their name. This nifty contraption allows you to design any kind of drawing or design that you want on a free open source software called Inkscape. You make your design in Inkscape, plug this nifty little robot into your computer, and the Eggbot will draw your design on the ovoid or circular object of your choice. Some objects that we've already tested it on include blank Christmas ornaments, eggs, mini pumpkins, and even mugs. You might notice that we're using a Sharpie in all of this footage. That's because to change the color, you simply place the Sharpie of your choice in the pen arm before pressing go. This way, your design is only limited to the number of colored Sharpies that you have. It's a great way to learn your first design program and end up with a beautiful, one-of-a-kind object. Do you want to come and check our Eggbot out? We're going to be doing Easter egg decoration programs using the library's Eggbot at all seven branches in the month of March. Check your local branch calendar and come on by and experiment with us. You will be sure to leave with the absolute coolest Easter egg on the block. Hello everyone, we are here at the Wayne County Public Library Children's Department and we're curious about who is going to win a gold medal. And we're not talking about the Olympics. We are in fact talking about the American Library Association's Youth Media Awards. The Newberry, the Caldecott, and the Prince. 
So stay tuned, we're going to tell you some potential candidates for the winners of these awards. All right, so my name is Naomi and I'll be talking about some of the contenders for the Caldecott Medal this year. The Caldecott Medal is awarded each year to the most distinguished American picture book for children, and it tends to focus on the illustrations. One of my favorite picture books from this year is Dan Santat's After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again. This book is about if Humpty Dumpty fell and all of the King's men were able to put him back together again, but now he's afraid of heights, which used to be his favorite thing. His anxiety is on full display on one of my favorite spreads in the book, where he goes shopping for cereal. He can only reach the boxes on the bottom, and those boxes have names like leaves and cardboard, while up top there are boxes called Free Toy and Just Marshmallow. So even though Dan Santa has already won a Caldecott, you know, in 2015, I'm hoping After the Fall does really well this year. Um, because it's a story about learning how to rebound after something awful has happened to you, and the artwork is just lovely. Another possible contender is All the Way to Havana by Margarita Engel, and it's illustrated by Mar Mike Curado. This book is set in modern-day Cuba, and the cars, nearly all pre-1959, really steal the show in this book. The story follows a boy and his family driving into town for a birthday party in their blue car that they've kept running for decades. It's a really gorgeous depiction of Cuba, and one of the spreads is like practically a rainbow parade of cars going in and out of town. Um, it's really cool. So now I'm going to hand you over to, to Diana, who's going to talk about some of the Newberry contenders. To win the gold medal for the Newberry Award. The Newberry Award is given for writing. The Caldecott is for pictures, so the Newberry Award is for the writing in a children's book. And I've got two favorites that I will be cheering for. One of them is by Lauren Wolk. Lauren Wolk won the silver medal last year, so maybe she'll win the gold this year. The book is Beyond the Bright Sea. It takes place on a fictional small island off the coast of Cape Cod, and it takes place a while ago in the previous century. A little girl who's been named Crow by her adoptive father, Osh, actually ended up on the island as a baby she arrived in a rowboat. She has some questions, obviously, now that she's 11 years old. Who put me in that rowboat? What, where did I come from? And she suspects it might be a neighboring island, which has been used in the past as a leper colony. The people in town think that perhaps she's from the leper colony as well. They refuse to let her attend school there, and they usually keep a distance from her. So in this interesting story, Crow tries to find out what's happening on the other island. She sees a fire over there. Who could be having a bonfire on this island that is now empty of people? And she questions Osh, who is reluctant to tell her what he knows. So it's kind of a mystery, part family story, and very interesting. Really good writing. Another contender for the Newberry that is a favorite of mine is Hello Universe by Erin and Trotta Kelly. Miss Kelly has not won a Newberry gold or silver before, but she did win the Golden Kite Award, so she does have a kind of gold medal. The Golden Kite Award is given by other children's authors. In this story, you can tell a lot by just looking at the cover. There are several characters, all about the same age, and the little boy in the cover, you can see that he's down in a hole. It's actually an abandoned well. And he's down there because the bully in the story, Chet Bullens, great name, has tossed his backpack in there. And inside the backpack is his pet hamster. Maybe guinea pig, pet guinea pig. <laughs> and there are two girls in the story that decide to try to help him out. Do they become friends in the end? Just Chet Bolins learn a lesson, or maybe it's Virgil Salinas, the little boy who is down in the well, who ends up learning a lesson. It's a good story about overcoming some prejudices. About Nick, tell us about some books for older students, young adult books. 
So I'm going to be talking about some potential winners of the Prince Award, which is for young adult teen books. Uh, and Midnight at the Electric is the one that's probably closest to previous winners of the Prince Award. It takes place over three different time spans in the future with a girl about to go on a Mars colony because the world is doomed. Uh, she finds some letters in the house she's staying at before she leaves that talk about the family that used to be there in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. And those letters are actually also relating to the family before that living in England in 1919, right after World War I, and detailing how they were struggling with dealing with the aftermath of that. And the Dust Bowl family is obviously struggling to deal with the Dust Bowl and Dust Lung, where the one daughter is sick. So it kind of relates all three stories back and forth, and the one constant character in all three of them is named Galapagos, and it's a tortoise. But that one's probably the closest to previous winners. The two that I think should one of them should win are The Hate You Give and Long Way Down. Long Way Down is by Jason Reynolds. It is entirely in verse, and it takes place over the course of 67 seconds as the 15-year-old boy is riding down an elevator after stealing his brother's gun after his brother was just shot on the street. So it takes place uh, as he rides down the elevator and every... he's on the seventh floor, so every floor he stops at, a different person from his brother or family's past kind of talks to him about the history behind the gun violence in their community and their neighborhood. And since it's written in verse, it moves really fast and it's actually a very beautifully written book and it's kind of very relevant to what's been going on in the news today. The second book, third book, is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas and it's a little more closer to what's been going on with the Black Lives Matter movement. It follows a 16 year old girl named Star who is living in a very poor neighborhood while also attending school in a suburban uh, neighborhood where the school is a very private, wealthy uh, private school. And she witnesses her childhood best friend being shot by a police officer while he was unarmed, and it ends up making national news, and she struggles throughout the book with dealing with the attention that that's getting both nationally and between her community, some not so savory people in the community and then those who go to our school. So it's both, it's focusing on her struggle with trying to cope with those different types of communities grasping around that issue. But my favorite of the three is Long Way Down. But any three, of, any one of them would be good. We'll be looking forward eagerly to find out who wins the gold medal when the American Library Association announces the winners on Monday, February 18th. 8 a.m. Mountain Time, but since we don't live there, it will be around lunchtime. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arlene, and I'm going to show you how to make a pedestal plate. We recently made these in our upcycling program here at the library. It involves a plate, glass or porcelain, some sort of base. It can be a glass, a goblet, an ice cream bowl, and then clear Gorilla Glue which you can purchase at your local hardware store. You want the clear, non-foaming Gorilla Glue. Now what I like to do is I like to mark, especially if it's a clear plate, I like to mark where the center of the plate is. Um, just an eyeball mark so that when I flip it over, I can um, center the, the glass. So this is a nine inch plate, so it's slightly actually under nine inches. So I'm just gonna take a Sharpie. And the nice thing about Sharpies is you can make the mark, but then take it off with a, with a magic eraser. So just make a few marks there. And then go to the other direction, kind of center it, and try and make a few little marks there. That just kind of gives you an eyeball of where the center of the plate is. Now I'm gonna say the center is right there. And then I'm going to flip, now I, like I said, I do it on the front so that you can take it off. Otherwise you'll be gluing the mark onto your, your plate. All right, then what you're going to do is you're going to take your Gorilla Glue. Well, first thing we'll need to do is kind of judge. You want to go bottom to bottom and judge where, using that little mark, kind of judge where you want to put the uh, pedestal part of it, the goblet part. 
Okay, so I'm gonna, I don't think I'll mark it this time. So I kind of have an idea that I wanna kind of go in about an inch from the edge here and just make a circle of the Gorilla Glue. And then you will just take the glass and place it into the glue. And you can adjust a little bit if you're not quite centered. You can see the, the glue is, I want to spread it around a little bit. Now what you want to do is let this sit for 24 hours to, um, to cure. So um, we will see you tomorrow. All right, so we're back. The glue has dried for 24 hours. So we'll see how it turned out. I think it looks perfect. We'll take a little magic eraser, get that little Sharpie mark off there. And um, now I wouldn't wash this in the dishwasher, but you can hand wash it. It's, it's on there securely, so. Um, you can use these, as you can see, you can put cookies on them, you can put a cake on one. I have one at home on my counter with fruit on it. Um, there's just many things you can use them for. They're nice if you're entertaining, you can set them at different levels so you can have food on them. So um, that's how we made our pedestal plate. Thank you. Our next segment takes us into the community as Crystal Brown highlights Ohio Meets Jobs here in Wayne County and what they can do for you. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County is here for you. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County's career events meet you where you are, whether you're highly skilled or just starting out in the workforce. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County is here for you. The Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County Center provides a broad range of services in one convenient location that make finding the perfect career so much easier. Our team can help you prepare for employment and refer job opportunities by matching your skills and interests. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County has over 15 organizations providing you a network of valuable career events. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County's career events meet you where you are, whether you are highly skilled or just starting out in the workforce. The Wayne County Public Library is one of the many great partners in the Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County Center. The Wayne County Public Library provides after business hours access for job seekers to ohiomeansjobs.com, information and referrals to organizations, and one-on-one -on -one assistance with Microsoft Office. Other career events include career exploration, budgeting tips from a professional banker, understanding the importance of your social media, and many more. During your visit at Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County, be sure to stop into the Resource Center. The Resource Center features career opportunities and computers with internet access to Ohio's largest display of job postings through ohiomeansjobs.com, Browse through educational training catalogs to explore skilled training programs and labor market information to find employment projections and industry wages. A friendly and knowledgeable staff will guide you through an orientation and connect you with appropriately matched career events. Career events are available free of charge to any Wayne County resident. Be sure to stay up to date on available Wayne County job opportunities and register for career events by visiting our redesigned website, everybodyworks.org. Ohio Means Jobs Wayne County is customer focused on both individuals and businesses because our goal is simple, everybody works. Visit us Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. at 358 West North Street, Worcester, Ohio or online at everybodyworks.org. If you're interested in learning more about our programs, events, books or other services, you can find out more on our website or Facebook page. Thank you so much for watching today, and we look forward to seeing you here at the Wayne County Public Library.